In this video, we're going to build and characterize a series DC motor. What I've done is I've taken the motor that we put together in the second video in this series on motors, and I've replaced the permanent magnets that form the stator with an electromagnet. Now before we go and characterize this DC motor, let's take a look at some of the results that we got with the previous motor to review some important concepts. These are the results that we measured in our third video in the motor series. We obtained an approximately linear relationship between speed and torque, and that's exactly what we expect with a permanent magnet motor. If you go and buy a motor, sometimes you would see something called the rated speed and the rated torque. Let me tell you what is meant by the rated speed and the rated torque. First of all, if we look at this graph, there are two danger areas, so to speak, with the motor. If a motor operates at a speed that's too high, it can fly apart. If a motor operates at a very high torque, you might recall that torque is proportional to current. If the torque is high, then the current is very high. And if the current is very high through the windings of a motor, then they can get hot due to resistive losses and the motor can burn up. Therefore, motors have a rated speed and a rated torque. You don't normally want to operate a motor at least for very long, at any speeds that exceed the rated speed, and you don't want to operate a motor at any torque that exceeds the rated torque. As you might recall, the highest speed that a motor can reach is called the no-load speed. That's the speed that a motor spins at when you don't have any mechanical load attached to the shaft. All of the mechanical power that a motor produces at the no-load speed goes to overcoming friction. Similarly, the highest possible torque that a motor can reach is called the stall torque. That's the maximum possible torque when the motor stops spinning completely. With a permanent magnet DC motor, we expect a roughly linear relationship between speed and torque if the voltage is held constant. If we were to, for example, lower the voltage, then the entire curve would shift down. If we were to increase the voltage, then the entire curve would shift up. When we carried out our motor measurements in video 3, we kept the voltage constant. Before we move on to series DC motors, I want to take a quick look back at the equations that cover a permanent magnet DC motor so we can review why we expect that curve to be linear. In problem 6 of the previous video, we showed a circuit diagram. Voltage V is the voltage applied to the motor. Current I is the current we supply to the motor. R represents the electrical resistance in the armature. And E is the back EMF. We derived a relationship that relates the speed of the motor to the torque of the motor. And as you can see, this is the equation of a line. What I want to do now is to see what the relationship would be between speed and current. Well, it's not very hard to convert torque to current, because in a permanent magnet motor, they're proportional by the torque constant. If I substitute in for the torque, I also obtain a linear relationship between the speed and the current. But this is only true for a permanent magnet DC motor. Let me show you why. As you might recall, in our previous motors, we used permanent magnets as the stators. Typically, these are only used in small motors. Large motors nearly always use electromagnets for the stators instead. Now, there are two ways of wiring up a stator. One way is to wire the electromagnet in parallel with the rotor. In that case, the magnetic field is constant, just like in a permanent magnet DC motor. In that case, it's called a shunt DC motor. The torque versus speed characteristics and the torque versus current characteristics are similar to those of a permanent magnet DC motor. The other way to wire up the stator is in series with the rotor. In that case, the magnetic field strength depends on the current. This is called a series DC motor, and we're going to characterize the one that we've built. But before we do that, let's derive the relationship between speed and torque so we'll know what to expect when we measure it. You're going to discover that the speed versus torque characteristics are not linear. The reason they're not linear is because the magnetic flux is no longer constant. It depends on the current. Our goal, firstly, is to find the relationship between speed and current in a series DC motor. Let's assume that we apply a constant voltage V to our motor. The voltage source supplies a current I. But unlike the previous situation, we have an extra resistance in series with the motor. That resistance has a subscript F on it. F stands for field. Again, we're going to call the back EMF E. From the circuit diagram, we can come up with a relationship between the back EMF and the current. Let's call that equation 1. 
As you might recall, the torque in a motor equals the torque constant times the current. The only problem now, though, is that the torque constant is no longer constant. This is because the magnetic field produced by the stator is no longer constant. It depends on the current. So we're going to have to use a different torque constant for this particular motor. For a permanent magnet DC motor, the units on the torque constant were newton meters per ampere. As I mentioned in a previous video, though, it's possible to express the torque constant in terms of per Weber. That's what we're going to have to do here. We're going to use variable phi to represent the strength of the magnetic field. It's measured in Webers. Therefore, for this motor, we're going to use torque constant with a prime on it to indicate that this torque constant is going to be per unit Weber. Previously, in a permanent magnet motor, the equation for the back EMF was the back EMF constant times the speed. But the back EMF constant is no longer going to be constant because the strength of the magnetic field now depends on the current. So I'm going to do the same thing with the back EMF constant. Previously, the back EMF constant had units of volts per radian per second. Since this is no longer a constant, we're going to introduce an alternative back EMF constant per unit Weber. Let's call this equation 2. Now, what controls the magnetic field phi? Well, it's the current through the windings. If you put more current into the stator, you're going to get a stronger magnetic field. In fact, the strength of the magnetic field should be proportional to the current. So I'm going to introduce another constant for this motor. Let's call it the field constant. Let's call this equation 3. I'm now going to substitute equation 3 into equation 2. Let's now substitute this new equation for the back EMF into equation 1. We can now solve this equation for our speed omega. As you can see, the relationship between speed and current is not a linear relationship. Because the current is in the denominator, there's something dangerous about this motor. And that is the following. As the current gets lower and lower, the speed gets higher and higher. So if this motor is operated without adequate mechanical load attached to it, the speed can get so fast that the motor can fly apart. Therefore, it's usually not advisable to operate a series motor without a mechanical load attached to it. Now, let's go ahead and derive the relationship between speed and torque for the same motor. Let's look back at our equation for torque. Our torque now depends on the current. If I take equation 3 and substitute it into our equation for torque, I'll get a new equation. The torque depends on the square of the current. For the permanent magnet motor, the torque was proportional to the current. Let's call this equation 4. If I substitute equation 4, into our equation for speed, I can find the speed versus torque relationship. As you can see, we have a nonlinear relationship between the speed and the torque. The motor will have a maximum torque because this curve will cross the x-axis eventually. Now, where it crosses the x-axis depends on the values of all these constants. But as the torque becomes very low, the speed of the motor increases quite a lot. In a minute, we're going to go over and measure the speed versus torque characteristics of our DC motor. But before we go over to the bench, I just wanted to point out that to fabricate the stator here, I didn't use a coffee can this time. The metal in a coffee can is a little bit too thin in order to get the magnetic flux that we need. So instead of using a coffee can, I used one millimeter thick sheet steel. This is Q235 steel. It's soft steel, and I went over to a machine shop and had the stator fabricated there. Let's go over to the bench now and measure our curve. I've set up our motor here in exactly the same way I had it set up in video three when we measured the torque. The only difference between this motor and that motor is the stator. We've replaced the permanent magnets with an electromagnet. I've disconnected the DC power supply and we can check our voltage, 40 volts, just like in video three. Let's go ahead and measure the speed versus number of screws graph. To measure the speed, I'm going to use a tachometer here. Let's hook up our DC power supply and measure it without any screws in the bucket at all. 273 RPM. That's significantly faster than the motor was with the permanent magnet stator. We'll proceed with one screw in the bucket. Two sixty-four. Two screws. 
151. Three screws. 140. Four screws. One thirty one, five screws. One ten, six screws. One twenty, seven screws. One oh one, eight screws. 99, nine screws, 89, 10 screws, 76 RPM, 11 screws, 67 RPM, 12 screws. 55 RPM, 13 screws. 46 RPM, 14 screws. Looks like the motor is stalling with 14 screws. Let me give it another try. We've reached the stall point of the motor. As you can see from the graph, this particular motor reaches a very high speed as the load is reduced. If I were to remove the mechanical load from this motor completely, the speed would be even higher than that. Now that we have the graph of speed versus number of screws for this motor, we can find the speed versus torque graph. After we have the speed versus torque graph, we can do a curve fit. And in order to do the curve fit, we can use the equation that we derived earlier. We expect the speed versus torque for this particular type of motor to follow a relationship that has the square root of torque in the denominator.